All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and start introducing people um, so we can get the ball rolling because I don't wanna run out of time and I want everybody to hear everything. Uh, so welcome everybody, I am Autumn. I'm here at the Ballakinwood Library. Um, thank you guys all so much for signing up and coming out. It's so exciting. We haven't done this format in a while. So exciting! it's exciting to see so many people at one time. Certainly um, more than we could fit in one room at any given time. So I'm glad we have this opportunity. Um, just a friendly reminder that while the presentations are going on, if you could have mute on on your computers, that way we don't get any background noise. And just a heads up, we are recording this. Um, because we do want to make it available on our YouTube page when all is said and done. So with that being said, I want to introduce Janet, who is um, in charge of programming for the Ballakinwood Library Board. Janet, there you so I have so many people up here now, I'm like, gotta find you. Amazing. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm right this next to you. Great. <laughs> this is Hi, great. My name is Janet Michelson Gvariahu. I'm a pediatrician in the area of the library, and I also have been on the board for quite a few years. And my favorite thing is to set up programs. So I am familiar with Erin Bentley, who's one of our speakers, but um, very excited uh, to meet and to hear from Jenny Rose Carey, who's an avid hands-on gardener and a professional horticulturist. She was born in England to a family of botanists and gardeners. She grew up in the countryside and designed her first herb garden when she was 16. And she moved to the Philadelphia area with her American husband to, and has gardened here ever since. So she has degrees in biology, horticulture and education. So Jenny Rose brings a strong teaching background to her writing and her presentations. Professionally, she's been the director of two public gardens. I didn't know, I think that's fabulous. The Ambler Arboretum of Temple University and the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society's garden at Meadowbrook Farm. She's now devoting her time to writing, speaking, and tending her own four and a half acre garden called Northview, where she has lived for over a quarter of the century. Now, would you like me to introduce Erin also, or shall we do that before she speaks? Um, well, we can just say hello to Erin, Vice President of the okay. Lower Marion Historical Society. You'll see her somewhere on your screen. Right. So Erin Betley has lived in Lower Marion for almost a decade with her husband and her two young daughters. Erin's uh, worked with um, the Lower Marion Historical Society, uh, supports their mission of preserving and sharing the rich history of Lower Marion and Narberth by broadening the kinds of stories they tell and engaging the community in the process. Erin um, followed her lifelong love of the natural world into a career as a conservation scientist and educator with the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, which has more dinosaurs than you'll ever see in one space. <laughs> um, in her spare time, work with the society. She integrates her interest in preservation and conservation with local history and love for historical research. She is not yet the kind of gardener she aspires to be, but feels fortunate to be able to learn from luminaries like Jenny Rose Carey and her inspiring predecessors that are spotlighted tonight. So I think Jenny Rose, thank you. Thank you. I just wanna give a quick shout out to Erin if you guys were around this time last year, we had Erin with us once before um, doing our presentation on Idenly. It was just incredible. So we are grateful that that she's uh, given us this opportunity to join together um, with her on this particular, with the Historical Society, with this particular presentation. We will be taking questions. There will be a Q&A. I think we agreed that it would be at the end just for the sake of of uh, not double answering questions. So you guys should see a Q&A button. If you have questions at any point during this, put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. And that way the Q&A uh, that will be seen, your questions will be seen by all of us here that are hosting this. So Aaron, me, Jenny, and Janet, we will see it immediately. And then that way we can get to the questions and it won't get logged down in the chat, but certainly feel free to chat amongst yourselves. 
um, in the chat. And with that, Jenny, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's it's lovely to see friends old and new. I recognize some faces and some names, and that's lovely. Thank you for being here to support. Um, so I am very excited to be able to um, to really share some of the work that I've been doing for a couple of decades. And I know that um, many of you have heard me speak on this before, but the, the today's talk is really slanted towards um, Philadelphia and less to do with gardens and more to do with the women and the societies that they, they formed. So with no further ado, let me share screen. And here we go. So I, I have been studying um, since uh, I was at uh, Temple Ambler, which is a women's history site, um, uh, since I was director there of the Arboretum. Um, you know, so it's it's over 20 years now. Um, but I've always been interested in women's history because I grew up as the oldest of four girls. And then all us four girls had uh, between us. Uh, my dad now has 10 granddaughters. And uh, so there's a lot of women. And my mum was one of two, two uh, girls. And then, of course, the next generation is three boys. So there you go. Has to even out some point. So this is, I'm going to start with this, it's a glass lantern slide from the temple archives. And I have to give a shout out to all the wonderful archives that have let me use their images and I'll have their names at the, at the very end. So the time period I'm going to be talking about is post-Victorian, so 1900 to about 1940. And I don't think I really quite get up to the 40s in this one. And what, what I'm going to be, oh. There we go. So I live in, I'm sitting up in the third floor right here of my house. And um, this is where I live. And hopefully some of you have been to, to visit. It's over in Ambler. And the reason I'm starting with it, because it's another twist on why I'm so passionate about local, um, ho local horticulture and the Philadelphia region in particular, but also local history. So um here I am driving up um, in around 1910 into my driveway, and we still have those two uh, columns that are there. And the the person that built this house and his wife, I'll show you in a minute, but is Wilma Atkinson, who was the founder of the Farm Journal. And I have four and a half acres here, but he had a hundred and something acres, and it was what they called a model farm. And what do I mean by that is Philadelphia was really a hub for horticulture and the new sort of scientific horticulture that was um, coming across America a hundred and what would I say a hundred and well, forget which decade we're in now a uh, hundred and twenty five years ago or if not more um, and I have his autobiography and it's available online if you want to find it. Um, and it's all all there. You can read it. And he says, all my life, I'd study the landscape art and hope that someday I would be situated so I could practice it. So the house looks pretty much the same. And I've kept the the middle sections open. Um, and he made many journeys to inspect nurseries and brought beautiful growing things for the adornment of our lawn. So this is this is solid Victorian uh, when he uh, built it in 1887. Um, but he lived here for 30 years. So it's going into the time period that we're talking about. And um, we do have a few Wilma trees. This one, unfortunately, got destroyed in the tornado that came through. So here we get on to some women. Um, so the Atkinsons were Quakers. And one of the things I've studied for a long time is the influence of Quakers on our local history. And I'm sure many of you are aware of, of this. Um, and their love of nature shines through and their love of um, education of women. And I think this really um, makes a lot of what we're talking about possible. And here are their three daughters and we have three daughters and we both have an Emily. I don't have an Elizabeth or a Gertrude. Um, but one of the things that's in Wilma's autobiography was this image of the first suffrage parade, New York, May 4th, 1912 and that might seem a little bit off but it, when you think of the Quaker um, push for abolition 
Uh, Wilmer was a fighting Quaker. He fought in the Civil War twice. He came back, ran the paper a bit, and then went back and fought some more. Um, but he, it turns out, this was important to him. I think maybe his wife and three daughters had something to do with it. But in the book is also this map of Pennsylvania showing the vote on November 2nd, 1915. So 120, 100, 100, not, okay, I'm not good at math, 109 years ago. And if you look, find your county on that. And uh, the ones in black were against suffrage and the ones that were in white are for suffrage. So the measure did not pass in 15 and it took another five years for national suffrage. I'm not sure of when Pennsylvania, whether that's preempted Pennsylvania or not, but I thought you would find that interesting. Also, you can tell how many men of voting age were in our counties. And if you look at the numbers and then you think how many, certainly Montgomery County, you know, now probably 800 and 50,000 or something like that. And it was eight, seven, 87, and then it's like 20,000 then. So quite an amazing thing. So here is the Farm Journal building. Some of you may have seen this in West Washington Square. Um, as you drive around, you'll see Farm Journal building. It's now part of the, um, the uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania health system. Um, and this is inside, inside the subscription um, unit department and you'll see that most of them are women working there and he got over a million subscribers um which was what his goal was um and i have many of the things articles from the farm journal and the interesting thing about this and how it ties into what we're talking about um today is that the paper was written for the farmer and the farmer was assumed to be male but it was also had sections for boys and girls and women. And I'll be quoting from this page um, later on. And I'm going to top and tail this lecture with some sort of um, some thoughts from Theodore Roosevelt. This is uh, he'd sent uh, to Mr. Atkinson. I congratulate you on the work you're doing. It's fine that the Farm Journal should take up the protection of bird life more power to your elbow, faithfully yours. And the other theme that runs through this lecture is, is so tied to what we're doing today about protecting birds and native plants and things like that. And I think a lot of the women that we will be talking about, yes, we we're interested in food production, but also we were thinking about native plants. So there's a lot written about the war in the Farm Journal, um, but Taking a step back, I want you to look at this picture, A, of the woman that looks such an unlikely shape. And I know that was the, you know, what they wanted, that hourglass shape, but, you know, it's just unbelievable. Um, but this is from um, 1869, and you might recognize the, no the names, Catherine Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe. And the reason I'm putting it in is because I think you need to get a context of what the women that we are concentrating on today did. You have to see what came before. And so this is written in the American woman's um, home. There is at the present time an increasing agitation of the public mind evolving crude speculations as to woman's rights and duties. The chief cause of women's disabilities and sufferings is that women are not trained as men are for their peculiar duties. And this comes into what we'll be learning tonight. So here we go. Let's do our training, everyone. Let's uh, on your Zoom do a little bit of stretching. But you know, this is this is from the an in, interesting magazine called the the Delineator. Um, and when you think of that lady on the previous slide, you know, you wouldn't be able to in corsets and bustles and all those things. You are not able to do any of this stuff. You're really stuck. And you can't garden wearing all of that stuff. So hand in glove and why I like social history so much is if you're wearing a bustle and a corset, you know, what can you do? So it's sort of like which comes first, the clothing or the training. 
And as we know, women have always worked. It was a sort of misnomer to say that they stayed at home. Many of them did, but these are the top 10 in the in the late 1800s were these things. So domestic servants, laborers, seamstresses, mil milliners, hats, obviously, teachers, cotton mills, laundresses, woolen mills, farmers and planters and nurses. So some of these were socially acceptable for um, like teachers and um maybe i suppose um nurses for some of the echelons of society others were not considered so so much so and what changed a lot of it and um you know we're sitting uh, in the presumably most of us are in the greater philadelphia area but you know um our colleges around here were really an impetus for change so while these ladies from Vassar and um you know these different flags here on the left hand side were concerned about their hats they were also concerned about their brains so as Bryn Mawr um let's just concentrate on Bryn Mawr for now opened up the graduates were coming out of these um college programs and they're like well now what now what can I do and it turned out that that whole generation that early generation was like, I don't think I really want to get married. So many of them didn't get married and um, they could become a teacher, a librarian, a nurse, a nanny and those sort of things. And around this time was when some of the early work uh, about social um, awareness was happening, like Jane Adams in Chicago. So this is the sort of question that was uh, um being bandied around. As yet, few are aware of how many sources of lucrative enterprise and industry lie open to a woman in the employments directly connected with the family state. And this leads out of the Victorian notion of the woman's sphere, which was the house and the garden. And it was seen as a remedy for the varied sufferings of women who are widows or unmarried and without means of support. And as many of you know, um, if you lost your husband or um, if you never married, you know, uh, you didn't have a, a positive means of support if you couldn't get some sort of a job. And I know from uh, my husband's family, who's from here, um, his great grandmother lost her husband uh, on the way back from World War One. So 1918. And she had four young children and a farm and a, a house and no visible means of support because that wasn't you know factored into society so interestingly history does repeat and here we are in the progressive era and uh as they say it's a time of social economic and environmental uncertainty does that sound like anything no not anything like today right and there was this big shift from agriculture to industry people were moving into the cities at a fast rate high immigration there were all these disenfranchised groups, particularly women, who came together for positive change, suffrage and temperance. And interestingly, the number that were involved in the temperance movement were greater than those involved in suffrage. Oh, and here we we need something to do. Right. So it I, it does crack me up because I'm often in a library looking at these and more online now. But when I got these out of a library magazine, you know, uh, and they're showing these um they're showing these women. I mean, like the guys are doing golf and the woman in her white dress note is steering that absolutely amazing lawn mower. And then on the uh, left, I love this one. A well-made lawn needs a well-made mower to keep it in good condition is, you know, very interesting. Um, so horticulture was almost just about seen as a socially acceptable field for women. Um, and during the war, it became more so, but it was sort of on the fringes of this women's sphere. So as women went into horticulture, obviously there are people that are naturally drawn to it or grew up on a farm or, you know, other things like that. But they used this to expand their opportunities. One of the people um, offered a tangent a little bit here, but one of the people that did influence this was the writer and gardener in England called Gertrude Jekyll. And she was a prolific writer and she doesn't look like she would be a trendsetter, um, you know, an SEO queen or whatever, but for whatever reason, whatever she was writing was taken on 
very much by the American um, the American women in particular as something that they wanted to do. And I was lucky enough to go to her house many years ago. And now uh, those of you who belong to the Royal Oak, uh, this is being taken over by the National Trust now. So at some point in the next few years, it will be open to the public more. And here's from a glass lantern slide. Her plantings were incredible. And many of these women did have gardeners, but they actually wanted to garden themselves and produce the color effects and often the drawings and things like that. Here's a few of her color schemes uh, for the flower garden. So as we know, when you read English books, sometimes they work here and sometimes they don't. And this lady knew all about SEO, search engine optimization, because look at the title of her book, A Woman's Hardy Garden. She's got all the buzzwords, the garden, and it's hardy plants. So we mean perennials and things by that which was a flip from the earlier Victorian carpet bedding of annuals, and it's targeted to women. And this is 1903. So Victoria's been dead two years. She lived in New Jersey, up on the border between um, New Jersey and New York State. And she she's not a good writer. If you read this book, you'll be like, oh my goodness, this lady doesn't even know how to put a sentence together. But she did know how to garden and her friends apparently pushed her to write this book. And then she wrote another one, a, another um, Hardy Garden. They're available online and reprint, but I love the front color, cover. Uh, Greek columns with foxgloves and uh, stylized foxgloves. I just love it. Um, her friend and another very well-known author who's very involved in our story, is Louisa Yeomans King. And she wrote primarily for women again. And she was a, a born in New Jersey, a national leader. And her main garden, she had another one in um, New York State, um, but this one is Alma, Michigan, that is unfortunately no longer there. But she wrote uh, many books, including uh, many magazine articles. This one, The Well-Considered Garden in 1915. So the sort of underlying current of this whole lecture is how women gather together to uh, make change. And this is just a stock photo of uh, women, but I love looking at their faces and how the fact that some of them look at the camera and some don't. Um, this is from the twenties. You can tell more, it's a bit later than, uh, but I like the cloche hats and everything. Um, so the club philosophy was coming out from the really post civil war when they were rolling bandages and then sort of the late 1800s, the, you know, the club movement started um, forming, but they were considering any aspect of the environment affecting women and their families. And that was really the, the main thing. So these are the four, five main ones that I'm going to go through today. And I am deli deliberately chose this one of women shoveling manure um, to start the lecture because, you know, you have to like getting dirty and, you know, in long dresses, shoveling manure, that is a really interesting uh, conundrum. So we're going to talk about Garden Club of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania School of Horticulture of Women, Garden Club of America, Women's National Farm and Garden, and the Land Army. So here's the, the first one in the, of this sort of group. And all of these women did know each other. This one is uh, the club that I belong to. It's called um, Garden Club of Philadelphia, and it's uh, motto is Fiora Hortensis or Garden Mad. So it really was expanding the, they wanted to expand their own knowledge, but they also wanted to do civic plantings to beautify Philadelphia. And actually their first project was to row out into the middle of Schuylkill in their long dresses and plant plants on the little island called um, St. Peter's Island in the middle near where the regattas start. So when you're down by the regatta, there's that little island. And they, they thought that was a disgrace. So they went out and planted plants on it. And this was their leader, Elizabeth Price Martin. And she said, with our own hands, we sowed the seeds and planted the tiny seedlings in the permanent borders and had the joy of seeing them bloom. Then we lived among the beauty of these new friends. And this is where she gardened in Chestnut Hill. And it's still there today. The walls are still there. The plantings are not necessarily um, with very sort of colonial revival, but old fashioned flowers. And next one is the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women. This has become Temple Ambler. There were other schools up in New England, uh, Lowthorpe, which is in 
I can never remember how to pronounce it, Gro Groton, Connecticut, no, Groton, is it in Massachusetts or Connecticut? Never been, but would like to go at some point. And then the Cambridge School up in Massachusetts, but they weren't quite the same. They were much more design and less practical. So where was this movement coming from? It was coming from Belgium and England and Germany. And this picture I love a little bit later, but the lady second from the right is Beatrix Havergal. And this is at the Waterbury School outside Oxford. I've been to many times. I went to Oxford, so it was a good, uh, easy place to go to. It has amazing herbaceous borders. And I met one of their oldest um, alumni, um, you know, some years ago and had a nice cheese sandwich with her at her house in Oxford. And um, she said that this lady, Beatrix Havergill, who was the, um, you know, the principal of this school, lived in the next village to Roald Dahl. And uh, she is the model for, in Matilda, Miss Trunchbull. And she looks very cheerful here, but apparently she had an iron, she ruled with an iron rod, so to speak. So the books that were coming out of um, England, this is 1908, uh, Gardening for Women by the Honourable Frances Wolseley. Um, I do love how, going back to this one, notice how they all carry their tools. They're all on their shoulder and they all look like they might be about to uh, injure somebody with them, I have to say. And look at the practical boots and they, they spend a lot of time talking about clothing. We'll do a little bit about that. The School of Horticultural Women was the brainchild of this lady, Jane Bowne Haynes. And she said, our dream was of a place where earnest minded women could live and dream, where they should not be expected to do household work, but should give their whole time to learning under competent teachers to become competent workers. So this is a different mindset. This is a mindset that is, I would like to venture innovative and uh, definitely on that progressive mold that we were talking about. And she goes on to say, it, bearing out the maxim, the trained hand with the trained mind, and listen to these three things, means mastery, power, and success. They're all words that traditionally were used um, to describe men, obviously, since the word master is very male oriented. There's another picture. This is in the library at Temple. Her family owned Wick in Germantown. They were nursery people. And this is one of the best places still to go and um, see old roses. And I see Jeff Groff, who was there many years, is on the call. So Jeff might be able to answer questions if you have those about Wick. And Jane, as early as 1907, Miss Haynes began arousing interest in the founding of a school of horticulture for women in America, a school where real training could be had, not only in theory, but in practice with real training, they obviously meant real training because they have it in twice, garden and orchard. The school opened February 1st, 1911, and has experienced many vicissitudes, as most new schools do, particularly pioneer schools. For well, we are pioneers, our school being the first and only one of its kind in the United States. And this is what they had them doing, plowing with the wheel hoe, climbing trees, uh, pruning, working in the greenhouse, and you know that the sailor collars, that was very much in, in you know, around World War I. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting to see what they had them doing. Our school was founded in order that the necessary practical and theoretical knowledge might be taught to women. It opens up to them a broad field of intellectual life combined with one of usefulness, healthfulness and independence. So as... All of these quotes, and I said to Erin, I love quoting their own words, but they are not, they're not small ideas, they're big ideas. Jesse T. Morgan, the director, was the first director, and the students were delightfully entertained by Wilma Atkinson at the Farm Journal building. After taking them over the building and showing them the wonderful up-to-date improvements, he took them to the beautiful dining room on top floor where luncheon was served, and Mr. Atkinson is on the advisory board of the school and is frequently consulted regarding matters of importance. So my house is about a mile and a bit away from the school. And it's really a nice circle to me that he was on their advisory board. This is the photo that Erin wants that is from the Schlesinger Library up in Massachusetts. Um, and this is taken 
in New York in 1915 at the second meeting of the Women's National Farm and Garden Association. And I will tell you about that next. And she was involved with that. She says it's not so much the brawn as the brain that counts in making a life out of the soil. Knowledge and dexterity are of far greater importance than muscular strength, because that was one of the criticisms that women, you know, got and still get is you don't have the the brawn or the muscular strength, but we managed to do it somehow. And even if it means using gunpowder, you know, we, we get on with it. At last, the weather has permitted us to plant out our trees in the holes dynamited in December for the apple orchard. And this just cracked me up. This lady on the right is the one that I love the most because, you know, there's flying dirt and everything and everyone's just going, ah, like this. There's no health and safety involved at all. So um, one of the so I uh, wrote co-wrote this with uh, Marianne Blair Fry, who was another alum and. Um, as I said to Erin, um, you know, we really wanted to do more with this, but this was, we managed to get this out while I was at Temple and to celebrate the 100 years. Um, so this quote I love, horticulture as a means to make a living appeals to me very much. And I believe that women will make, there's a lot of, uh, oops, sorry, there's a lot of uh, things going on up the top there. Um, Women will make better horticultures than men and the breadwinning in many homes will be vastly improved if the men remain at home to mind the baby and let the wife attend to the garden and horticultural work. So, you know, that's 110 years ago, very, very much um, in the forefront. And this is their colonial revival garden that was right at the entrance to the school. So a lot of perennials, you'll see irises, um, lavenders, peonies, roses, you know, it was all the popular things. So where did these graduates go? They became estate managers, nursery and greenhouse managers, writers and landscape designers. And in the middle here is Jessie Morgan, who you um, heard about in the previous slide. And behind her, uh, one, two, three, third from the left is Jane Bowne Haynes. And then the women right and left at the front and the middle are very important figures in some of the other things I'm going to talk to you. But Jessie says the day has dawned for the woman garden, gardener in March of 14. And the, the gardens, you know, went from strength to strength with the girls working in them. Little side note, parallel, that's a whole nother thing, which is the school gardens and the vacant lot gardens. Philadelphia was known for both of these things. So they had young people working in the school gardens and then, you know, vacant lots, which are still used today for, um, you know, cooperative gardens of various sorts and um, tree planting were being done back then. Number two, Garden Club of America. So this was spawned out of the Garden Club of Philadelphia and its sister clubs. Um, there were some in this area, including Princeton, there were the gardeners and the weeders in, in this area. There were um, 13 original clubs, I believe, 12 to 13. And Mrs. Um, Price Martin up on the left there in her garden was the president. And then you've seen these two lady writers were both vice presidents. And this is a little later into the 20s. But really, the whole theme of this is women gathering together for change and do I see parallels? Yes, because look, as I said, what were the original objects in 1913? Um, the objects of this association shall be to stimulate the knowledge and love of gardening among amateurs, to share the advantages of association through conference and correspondence in this country and abroad, to aid in the protection of native plants and birds and to encourage civic planting. I still think that is what most garden clubs aim to do. So this again is a stock photo, but again, look at these lovely faces all over the place because maybe it was right to look at the camera, maybe it wasn't. But um, this whole idea of municipal housekeeping, good public housekeeping must be characterized by order, cleanliness, healthfulness and beauty. Healthfulness comes up time and time again, um, but this does remind me a bit of Mary Poppins, I have to uh, have to say. So, and to the... The garden clubs, I have to say, 
Um, and I apologies to all the men listening here because sometimes it just makes me mad. But the garden clubs then and even up to almost the present day, in histories of what they have been doing, I have to say, get a bit of a bad rap because it was assumed that they would put their white gloves on and their hats and they drank tea. I see none of the problems with any of those things because they were actually getting things done and their vision, this is from 24, Helen Thorne, the objectives are of our organization as defined by our founders lie distinctly in the realm of pure idealism. Succinctly, we are an intelligent propaganda for the preservation of the beauties of our wonderful country and for the encouragement of gardening as a fine art among amateurs. So there's no small ideas here. And just a brief word about glass lantern slides. So this is what a, a magic lantern projector, this is electric, it did, I borrowed it. This is in the PHS library, but it's, it was borrowed from maybe the Academy. Um, and there are images online. This is an, uh, Emily Exley, who was a graduate of the School of Horticulture as, um, on Italian gardens. And these slides are amazing. They're black and white and they're hand painted. So you can't bet that those hollyhocks were pink. Uh, there, there was a place in Germantown um, where they, a lot of them were painted. And just like us, they like their garden visits. And there are some glass lantern slides around of these garden visits. The next organization is the Farm and Garden, the Women's National. And if you notice, it's the Woman's National Farm and Garden. It's not women's. Um, it was founded in the barn at Ambler on that same meeting when many of those women were in town, the initial organization, when they were in town to, to found Garden Club of America. Here they are walking up um, in and some in uh, cars onto the Ambler campus. The guests arrived by foot. Some of them walked from Philadelphia, 17 miles. Some came by carriage and some by train. And they, this slant was more to do with helping women. So to promote agriculture and horticultural interests among women and to further such interests throughout the country and to help women help themselves earn their living in the beautiful, ever-changing out of doors. So beauty comes in again, and it's more like teach them to fish rather than give them a fish. Um, and here's the barn and the site of the, the, the initial meeting and then the uh, following year. And then World War I comes in. And the organizations that we've just talked about are all involved. Women were called uh, to work in munitions factories and um, making anything that, that uh, particularly to do with the war effort. Wilma Atkinson in the Farm Journal uh, is talking about the need for farmers. Um, soldiers must be fed and only the farmer can feed them. Um, you know, so it, there's a lot of uh, propaganda that's coming out about it. And farmers, I know from personal experience, even in World War II, because my um, grandfather, one of my grandfathers was a farmer in England, and he still plowed with horses at the beginning of World War II. Um, and he would tell me that he didn't want those land army girls. And then they were so grateful for them because they knew they, you know, they had to be trained, many of them. Um, hostile at first. And then the very farmers who criticized them were nevertheless glad to get their help. And it was a thorough recommendation. It was through their recommendation alone, the demand for their services increased. But I have to say, when you read the literature, first they wanted prisoners to do it. Then they wanted young um, men who weren't old enough to be called up to fight. They wanted anyone but women, I have to say. But, um, you know, furlough farm workers back to the farm. There were every other opportunity. Um, but then when you look at the Vassar girl operating a tractor on the co college farm and three successful milkers up there. I mean, this it, when you look at some of the things they're driving, it just looks like, uh, uh, I don't know, that I have no idea how how on earth, but saving the hire of two men and the work of six horses is what this wife is doing in helping her husband's wartime farming. This is from the Farm Journal. And here's back at Ambler. And again, their tools are on their shoulder. The tricorn hat shows you it's wartime. Um, and 
they couldn't be farmers, so they had to be, you know, mini farmers, i.e. farmerettes. And this is one of the, um, the, the, the places where the farmerettes worked. It's Springton Farms, which some of you may know, uh, known as Hopkins Farm at Newtown Square. And this was the Garden Club of Philadelphia, and it shows you all the names of the people that were involved in this effort. And in the farm journal, it's a little demeaning to women, but it says, no, Miss Farmerette, powdering the nose is no longer practiced in high-class dairies and has nothing to do with the color of the cream, as may be learned by consulting the farm journal, a magazine which no farmerette, or in fact, anybody who wants to be the real thing can af afford to be without. So they could do captain's courses, they could do lieutenant's courses. It tells you how to get there by trolley and train, you know, um, and, the, the school was there at the right time to teach vegetable gardening, fruit growing, canning and preserving, poultry. Um, and if you notice down the bottom, it says a practical business course. Those of you who are in business might think when were the first chances that women could actually get business degrees? That didn't come along. I can't remember the exact date, but it wasn't very much until later, but they were teaching them double entry bookkeeping and everything else so that they could run these farms. And this is from the public ledger. And it says prominent women take intensive war courses. And there are um, rec records of women in their fur coats being dropped off by the chauffeur so that they could learn to grow carrots and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so where did they come from? It looks like... Um, these were numbers that I found. I don't know. I'm going to talk to Erin, but 912 girls with 600 on the waiting list in the summer of 18. It was all privately funded. The girls came from 17 percent college, 34 teachers and students, 11 percent professional industrial workers, 20. And I love this women of leisure, 18. They probably weren't leisure. There was probably not much leisure involved. I don't have a picture of this, but there was uh, from the School of Horticulture, a second line parade. Uh, this is way before America got into the war. But look what the ba banners said. The poultry department had hen against hun. The vegetable department, it isn't just luck that raises truck. But again, a stock photo with the votes for women. But I was having fun finding those. This is one from, um, I believe... This might be from the Schlesinger. Schlesinger. Um, this lady is from Long Island um, and the name has escaped me. But the whole motto was food will win the war. And this was a free vegetable exhibit uh, convention. And there was much propaganda, you know, uh, vegetables, canned vegetables and can the Kaiser too. And Mrs. Brewster, who was involved with the land army and the farm and garden said we stand or fall by our food supply. There's a lot of information out there about this and how war but gardens became um, a victory garden. And uh, the president, uh, Charles Lathrop Pack, there's, there's books by him if you're interested. And this, I believe, Erin, is the Bryn Mawr um, one, but I couldn't find the exact. I've got it in the uh, PowerPoint, but I can't remember exactly where I found it. But we no longer hear talk of woman's sphere in almost every field of action. The woman is holding up her end and she will never go back to the state of the anti-war period. So clothes, little diversion on clothes. It was very difficult to know what to wear to be able to rake and hoe. So you've got tabards, we've got putneys, you've got smocks. Smocks seemed very uh, popular and from the Farm Journal, it says, if we may judge by the length of women's skirts, the supply of dress goods must be almost exhausted. Very tongue in cheek. But all the magazines had these different um, smocks. Most of them look like they've got too much fabric and you'll get it caught on every rose bush. This one is more practical with the put knees and the, you know, the almost like spats. Um, but from the Farm Journal, another one, uh, quote, the girls are wearing overalls and yet no startled heaven falls. When first I heard it, I was shocked. In modest schemes, I've always mocked. But when I saw a transformed maid, I felt my opposition fade. Rather interesting. But if you look at during 15 to 45, look what happens. So you're going from, these are all at the school, 
um, long dresses to slightly shorter dresses to the, sort of the jodhpurs to denims and um, the older alums that I met at the school uh, one of them told me that they nearly weren't allowed to go to the School of Horticulture because um, they were going to have to wear denims. And back to World War I times, this is an advert from the Farm and Garden and a quote from the um, Farm Journal. The modest girl, when duty calls, starts looking for her overalls. And apparently they mostly looked in their brother's closets after they'd gone to war and saw what was left. And Wilma called them bifurcated nether garments so if you like that better some of you may even be wearing those things so here they are with their bifurcated nether garments and Wilma was very involved uh, with this whole farm movement I'm not going to dwell on it but there are these Biggle uh, books that um, that as far as I can gather I think Jacob Biggle was either Wilma or somebody in his office but you know there's whole books on keeping bees that was another thing that women were encouraged to do and dairy Lots of them went into dairy. Um, and then just at the end here, just a few that went into um, more of the design aspect. Uh, Beatrix Farrand, if you don't know any other names, uh, she worked at Yale, she worked at Princeton, she did Dumbarton Oaks. Um, that's probably one of her, and then all the ones up in Mount Desert Island. And um, she really was the, the, you know, she was the only founding member of the American Society of Landscape Architecture. And tomorrow I will be at Booked in Chestnut Hill, uh, which is a bookshop, uh, to talk about Harston, which is um, no longer much there. But um, the Springfield open space is trying to keep it open um, to use as open space and, uh, and various other things. It has old woods on it and other treasures. So, and uh, back in full circle, so Beatrix Farron was involved in designing these uh, pergolas at the um, Ambler Arboretum. Unfortunately, a big tree fell on this during the tornado and they lost 500 trees. And, but these gardeners and growers, you know, whether you call yourself an amateur or a professional, were very important, whether we were, uh, you know, rolling our lawns, whether we did, were dis using old fashioned plants such as this design at Colonial Williamsburg, uh, whether we were um, really taking garden design to a, a lovely level. This is Eth Ethel Saltus Luddington's garden. She was an early president of the, the Gardener's Garden Club, which was one of the other ones. Um, or whether you, this is also another gardener, um, member of the Gardener's Garden Club, Mary Helen Wingate Lloyd. And she said, in my first garden, I used to proudly say I first thing I planted was my own foot. And she had uh, 10 gardeners. There is the remnants of this garden there. Um, and that azure bowl at the bottom is incredible. And there are one or two little surviving irises, but that's what it looked like in the heyday. So um, I thought I would leave you with a few of those images. And the summary was the women moved out of their sphere and they gathered together for education and change. This is Mrs. Calvin Coolidge, who's the only one not wearing a hat and a uh, coat. Um, she welcomed the Women's National Farm and Garden Association. These are the back steps at the White House. So, you know, she was very involved, as was Mrs. Henry Ford and a few of the other um, people at the time. And they designed and maintained fabulous gardens. And the lasting impact has been civic improvement, greater freedom, better education in horticulture design, a lot of conservation awareness and the fabulous gardens. And leaving with a quote from Louisa, who I do love, and I did wear my pearls. I don't know if you can see them in honor of Louisa, um, but rich or poor, old or free, when we garden, we're at the same work. We work in faith that the seasons will still roll for us and for our sowings and plantings. There is no such meeting ground. There is no, no community of interest such as this of gardening. And I really hope that people will take those words and one final quote. OK, I promised you to end with Theodore Roosevelt again. And I find I find solace in some of these words and I find a call to action. So I hope some uh, some of these resonate with you. But um, Theodore Roosevelt, this is a quote. In a great democracy of free people, the protection of wildlife and the preservation of all other natural resources 
which underlie national prosperity and happiness must depend finally, as does the stability of the government itself, upon the support and willing service of every citizen. And if that's not a call to action, I don't know what it is. So that's your thought for the day. And I leave you, I do a once a month email. Um, I'm not selling it selling anything it's a quote starts with a quote from one of my books that i have behind me um and then you know like some uh, plant of the month and uh, a book usually a book review something like that and i've got a couple of open gardens coming up uh wow that ended up jazzy oh well uh april 23rd and june the 3rd they're unfortunately in the week but i am going to do probably in the fall a weekend day but um, it's a $20 um, donation. And then my books I've written, you saw the Century of Cultivation that is in the library. Erin um, said that's available and Glorious Shade. And then this is the one that came out in 22. And then I've just finished writing one on bulbs, which won't be out until September of next year. And here are my... Um, Final thanks to the, these archives and um, couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much. OK, thank you. Over to you, Erin. I'm going to stop share. Amazing. Thank you, Jenny Rose. Wow, I... I learned so much and I am so inspired. Uh, thank you for for everything. Um, so we'll, we will switch gears and take a more local look at what you just heard and I will share a screen, hang on. There we go, hopefully folks can see. Jenny can give me a thumbs up, yay. Okay, super, <laughs> great, um, okay so, Yes, I'm I'm full of ideas and I hope we have time for discussion um, at the end, but I wanted to thank you, Jenny Rose, and thank the Ballykinwood Library uh, for their interest in this amazing topic and for hosting tonight's presentation, where my hope is to link Jenny's research on early Philadelphia women in horticulture to our local history during the World War I era here in Lower Marion. And so what I hope to do for this brief presentation was to make some local connections to some of the themes that Jenny shared by sharing stories about connections to the places we know and that we see often in our travels around the township and show you how there is so much hidden information out there that can help us understand more about the history of our own community. Um, this is by no means a comprehensive look at all the connections to what Jenny shared, but I'll be spotlighting some uh, historical research uh, that reveals several compelling stories about women doing inspiring things, getting together for change over 100 years ago as the US was drawn into the First World War. I'll cover a lot of ground quickly and it's being recorded. So if you miss things, you'll be able to find it in the recording. So many of you are familiar with the term Victory Gardens and Jenny talked about these as well, especially related to World War II. So we're looking at the earlier versions of this, often referred to at the time as community war gardens. Here are a few posters from this era that I love to look at, and Jenny shared a few of these as well, representing how gardening was a way for people on the home front to support the war effort by growing their own food. So let's dive in, and I'd like to try to make this presentation interactive if possible. Um, so I'll ha I have a few questions kind of throughout, so if you'd like to participate, feel free to use the chat. So let's start with gardens. So World War I became in, uh, began in 1914, but it wasn't until April 1917 that the US entered the war. And what the newspapers of the day tell us is that almost immediately, prominent mainline residents formed something called a Mainline Community War Gardens Committee. And they started to organize a series of community war gardens through donations of unused land, one mile north and one mile south of the Pennsylvania Railroad, all the way from Marion to Villanova donations of seed and equipment and horses and labor to produce potatoes, beans, cabbages, carrots, turnips, and onions that sustain the community through wartime shortages. So what does the scope of this look like? So here is a Google Earth view of the about seven miles of railroad between Marion Station and Villanova. This should be something familiar to all of us on the main line, which of course was so named for this very railroad. 
So what would an area that spans one mile north and south of this railroad look like? Now, I live over here in Valley Kinwood, uh, close to the trailhead of the Kinwood Heritage Trail. We're just about a mile away from the railroad. So you can see that these gardens covered a wide swath of about 13 square miles of the main line. Um, so now using the chat, can I get some guesses on how many acres of community war gardens were planted in our area as part of this effort? Who wants to take a guess? Anyone? 50 from Joe Cosgrove, thank you. Any others? 100 from Julia, 300. Oh my goodness, you're under guessing. The answer is 400, 400. <laughs> so incredibly within like a month or two, according to the newspapers, over 400 acres had been planted along the main line as the committee worked in conjunction with the National Emergency Food Garden Commission in Washington DC that Jenny talked about. So this was part of a nationwide effort on the home front. One really interesting thing about this particular article that I showed earlier is it explains a bit about who was involved in working these 400 acres of gardens in our township and beyond. So we learned that as their high school studies wrapped up for the year, young women in Philadelphia were, quote, registering for farm work during the summer, planting, cultivating, pickling, and canning foods, unquote. And these are themes that align with the work of the Women's Land Army that Jenny spoke about. Um, and I have the same image of the farmerettes here um, and some of the other posters. So, you know, these themes really are local. Now, there's two names in particular that jump out on the leadership of this mainline Community War Gardens Committee. That's the chair, his name is Edward Bach, and committee member Samuel Bodine, and you will hear and see those names many times throughout my slides. So these men lived at opposite ends of the span of railroad. So what I plan to do is take you on a brief journey from here to there over a century ago. So we'll start in Marion Station. So where did Mr. Edward Bach live? Well, he lived across the street from the Marion uh, Railroad Station and Post Office as shown in this 1920 Atlas. I don't have time to go into this fascinating man and his family, but briefly, he was the editor of the Ladies Home Journal and it was nice to see a cover of that in your slides, Jenny. Um, and he's the namesake of many places here in Philadelphia and in Florida. He was married to Mary Louise Curtis Bach, who founded the Curtis Institute of Music. And here's a photo of them with their two sons in a garden, which is nice. And more locally, Edward Bach is the man responsible for our iconic street signs in Lower Marion. So here is the sign next to my children's bus stop uh, this past winter. And I'm sure many of us who live around here have the same. So what I want to do is move south a little bit. So I'm showing you the Marion station at the top and Bach's neighbors across what is High, was Highland Ave at the time, now is North Highland Ave. And we'll focus on this property here marked in red. This is the Frank Thompson estate. So who is Frank Thompson? Well, he was a mechanical engineer who ultimately became the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which explains the prime location of his home, like many other railroad executives who bought up property along the railroad. But Frank Thompson died unexpectedly in 1899, and this atlas is from 18, sorry, 1913. So what's going on with this estate 19 years, sorry, 14 years after his death? It turns out his daughter, Anne Thompson, was living there. And Anne shows up in a lot of the newspapers of the day. She was active with the Philadelphia Orchestra and the Red Cross in the Children's Heart Hospital and with the Girl Scouts. And since she never married, she kept her own name at a time when married women were referred to by their husband's names. And she is buried in the Thompson family plot at Laurel Hill West in Bella Kinwood. So it's nice to see Joe on the call. I have a few other uh, allusions to that cemetery uh, throughout the talk. So what is so notable about Ann Thompson related to this talk? So in 1917, as the U.S. entered the war, she donated a large chunk of her property to become Laura Marion's first community war garden. We learned that she gave them over to the care of the Marion Civic Association, which of course was run by Edward Bach. And, and this was an act that quote, started up a general sentiment at Marion in favor of war gardens. Um, and a little side note, uh, that's another tie to what Jenny shared. After the war, she moved to Bryn Mawr where she hosted students from the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women for a garden showing that raised money for the school. So back to these World War I era gardens, what do we know about them? 
we know they were growing potatoes. And we know that the whole community pitched in to plant the gardens and six acres of ground that had been prepared. So of course, Mr. and Mrs. Bach were there with their son, Curtis, who was in the Naval Reserve at the time. And the event that's described in this newspaper article was um, organized by the Marion Civic Association. So both Mary Curtis Bach and Ann Thompson were the highest dues paying women in the association. This is indicated by the civics records. And the civic records are a really rich source of information about many things, including this garden, these gardens through time. So here are some images of the civics yearbooks from the years 1917 through 1919 that spotlighting news about these gardens, which ultimately became 30 gardens over what was eight acres. And I want to zoom in on this 1919 yearbook because it answered one of my key questions about these gardens. Who was working them? and who was consuming the food that was grown in them. So I wanna call your attention to this last part. The gardens were for quote, the benefit of our domestic servants and their families, and they were planted and maintained by them. So I want to take a moment and do a quick survey of how many on this call live in or grew up in older homes in Lower Marion or around us that were built to house live-in servants. And so the signs of this are, servant stairs or servant quarters or servant call buttons or boxes. So feel free to use the chat to share. I know there's some of you on the call who do this because I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it in your houses, uh, but I'll show you mine. I live in one of these houses. Here I'm showing you the servant call button that's in the middle of my dining room floor and the bell that's on the third floor. And these were used, these were used in my 1926 house in Bella Kinwood to call a woman named Loretta Robinson Jones, who served the family that lived in my house for over three decades. So back to Marion. My next question about these gardens was, what can we learn about the people doing this gardening? And a great way to get basic information is to look at the census, right? So let's take a quick look at some survey data. So here I'm showing you the 1920 census for the Bach household. And what you can see at the bottom are the names of the women who did the cooking and the cleaning and the laundry that made it possible for Edward Bach to do his work and for Mary Curtis Bach to pursue her inspiring interests. And we'll see the names of five women listed here, ranging in age from 27 to 49 from several European countries. Uh, some are more recently arrived in the US, some have been in the US for decades. And so maybe some of these women were tending the gardens across the street maybe with other servants in the Bach household who didn't live in the home. Um, so who else might have been working in these gardens? And I'm going to stop sharing and restart sharing because I see some lines on my slides. And I don't want those to continue for the rest of the talk. There we go. Okay, they're gone. Great. Okay, so let's take a look at one of Bach's neighbors on the same census sheet. They lived on Marion Road. This is the family of William Stewart. This is his draft card here that showed he worked for the Emergency Fleet Corporation that was established to build and maintain ships for national defense and commerce during the war. And who was serving the Stewart family? It turns out it was two young women. They were multiracial members of the Great Migration. Their names were Maud Harrison and Lenora Simpson. They were both born in Virginia. They sought opportunities in the North and ended up cooking, cleaning, and caring for the children of these families in Lower Marion. There's a lot of relevant con context for the world these people were living in that I don't have time to get into, but I wanted to say that all of the major events listed here before, during, and after our time period of interest, and of course, much more that's not on this list at all, um, have direct connections to our local history in Lower Marion. So waves of immigration in the early 1900s and isolationist policies to restrict immigration, especially from Asia and Eastern Europe, the great migration of black Americans moving from the South to the North starting around 1910, the end of World War I, the return of veterans, including black Americans who served in the war, and the Red Summer of 1919, which was a time of violence and race massacres across the country, and the rise of the Klan in our area. Uh, the Spanish flu in 1918. Women gaining the right to vote <laughs> just over 100 years ago. Um, and the explosion of suburban development that followed all of this, and the use of racial covenants in the deeds of these newly constructed houses to restrict who could purchase them. 
And so I'm showing here some of the sources I've used to try to understand this history. This is history that shows up if you look at any census record or read some old newspapers. And so I realize this is heavy context, but I hope that it helps us understand a little more about the lives of the people who were working in these community war gardens in Marion. So back to the gardens. Here's the same atlas that I showed earlier in 1920. And I want to point out some familiar and some not so familiar features. So I'm calling out here what used to be a cute little office building of the Marion Civic Association. It's no longer there, but it used to be steps away from the railroad station. And now I want to look at something familiar. So who can use the chat to tell me what is between these red stars just south of the Marion Railroad Station, which was where these uh, war gardens were? What is that place in our community? Who knows it? I bet a lot of you walk there. <laughs> Anyone? Do I have to give you the answer? <laughs> it's the Marion Botanical Park created by the Botanical Society of Lower Marion in 1944. Yep. And yep. unlike- Carol, Carol and Janet had it. There you go. And unlike many other areas that had been gardened at this time, this area was never developed. And so here are some views of the park that I took this past weekend um, and also of the train station, you know, with spring upon us. And a lot of us have been here. And the historical record tells us that when we're there, we are walking on the grounds where community gardens fed our community 100 years ago. And it appears this knowledge has been lost within our community, but maybe not. If there's anyone out there who has some knowledge to add to this, I would love to connect with you. My email is on the final slide um, because, you know, what I'm learning is from looking at newspapers and, and archives, but there's, there's living knowledge that is also something that can be really helpful to help understand community history. Okay, so we're going to move up the railroad, but take a side trip to a connection to early women in horticulture that's hiding in Valley Kinwood. And this is relates to Elizabeth Layton Lee. And Jenny mentioned this, she co-founded the Women's National Farm and Garden Association in 1914. A year later, she became the director of the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for Women. And then when she finished that in 1924, she moved here to Ballakinwood. And this is where she resumed her career as one of the first women landscape architects in the United States. And Jenny had an absolutely inspirational quote from her. Um, and it's notable that her obituary was in the New York Times. That's what I'm showing here. Um, there's another lovely quote in Jenny's book, which is available through the library, along with her other two books that I just returned this weekend. So they are available <laughs> for someone else to take out. Um, but this was a quote um, from school director Louise Carter Bush Brown and said, Elizabeth, quote, had great dignity and personal charm and was deeply loved by many of the students who had the privilege of knowing her. So where in Valley Kinwood did she live? We learned from horticultural professional uh, directories that she moved to 12 Snowden Road, which is this lovely house that now backs up to what is now the Kinwood Heritage Trail. At that time, it was the railroad. And there's a cute detail on this 1926 atlas that I love. It's marked, quote, the Mrs. Lee. This is because Elizabeth lived there with both of her sisters named Mary and Faith. And we know this because they travel together often and they show up on a ship manifest traveling back from France in 1925. Let's move up to a hidden connection in Bryn Mawr. So this is a 1919 program for a gathering of the Women's National Farm and Garden Association, which was holding its fifth annual conference at Bryn Mawr College. You'll see a lot of familiar things on this program, familiar names. Um, for example, the Women's Land Army, you'll see Elizabeth Layton Lee was speaking on behalf of the School of Horticulture for Women. What I wanna call out here is our final hidden connection. This is the name of Samuel Bodine, Mrs. Samuel Bodine of Villanova. And hopefully that name sounds familiar because Mr. Bodine was serving with Edward Bach on the mainline uh, Community War Gardens Committee. So what we learned from these materials is that the conclusion of this program in May 1919, we learned that Mrs. Bodine hosted all the attendees at the conference at her gardens so they could see what the Bodines had created there, which turns out to be something very special indeed. And so here we are at the end of the line in Villanova. So the Bodine's home was a place called Stoneley. 
On the left is an image from a 1926 atlas showing Stonely and its very distinctive shape. And on the right is an image from Google Maps. And you'll see the property is, was within walking distance of the Villanova Railroad. So how many of us, please use the chat, have visited Stonely? I am certain many of us have. <laughs> Jenny has, I know that. Um, so feel free to share, you know, share your experiences there in the chat. It's an absolutely beautiful year-round natural garden in a biodiverse landscape featuring native plants and stunning garden features like the stone pergola here. Um, and this is all for the public to enjoy, thanks to the legacy and vision of the Bodine family and the Haas family and the commitment of natural lands. So who were the Bodines who at the turn of the 20th century created the stone lead that we can visit today? So Samuel Bodine, he was the head of the United Gas Improvement Company, and he did a lot of things. But what I find most interesting is his work with community war gardens. He was the commissioner of the Pennsylvania Chestnut Tree Blight Commission in 1913. He was president of the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society in 1914, and numerous organizations that supported soldiers and veterans. His wife, Eleanor Gray Bodine, was a supporter of the arts and of working mothers and children. But the best view of her is her decades of correspondence with the Olmsted Brothers firm. These are the premier landscape architects of the early 20th century. And in letters with the firm, she emerges as a woman shaping decisions about landscape grading, about garden placement, about what trees to plant and where. And we see that she is the force behind Stonely. Um, she's also somewhat elusive. This is the only known photograph of her in the last years of her life in the 1920s. And they're both buried at the family mausoleum in Laurel Hill West in Bella Kinwood. Here are some photos of what was the main entrance of the Bodine home as it looked in 1913 versus today. Here are two of I, uh, Stoney's iconic light gates. Again, 110 years apart, and peeking in the background of the older photo is Stonely's distinctive stone pergola that I showed earlier. So let's rewind to Stonely during the early 1900s. This is a map by the Olmsted brothers of the entire property, and we have a tremendous richness of information because of how meticulously they documented their work here and because those records were preserved. I'm going to zoom in on one part of this 65 acre property at the far back. So away from the main house, away from the show gardens that we walk through now. I'm calling out something here called the greenhouse complex and the superintendent's cottage here. So let's take a closer look at these structures and I'll explain to you why they're so special and how they connect to Jenny's talk. This is a 1903 rendering of a state-of-the-art greenhouse complex that was designed by Frank Miles Day. He was a noted Philadelphia-based architect known for his work on college campuses like Princeton and Penn and the University of Delaware. And I'd like to mention that his work at Stoney was inspired by Gertrude Jekyll, who Jenny talked about earlier. See, it all comes together. <laughs> Um, here's an image of Frank Miles Day with his wife, Anna Blakiston Day, who is another connection to Jenny's themes. Anna's sister, Emma, played a significant role in the National Women's Farm and Garden Association and the School of Horticulture for Women. She's featured in Jenny's book several times. She provided financial support and gave lectures at the school. And she owned the farm right next door. So she was a neighbor of Jenny's too, <laughs> which gives you a sense for the tight social networks among these remarkable women. So Frank Miles Day designed this greenhouse so the Bodines could win the awards at the flower shows. And the evidence shows that they won a lot of awards for flowers and vegetables. This is an image of the interior of one of Stoney's greenhouses. These are tomatoes interspersed with string beans in 1903. Frank Miles Day also designed this adorable cottage for Stoney's skilled garden superintendent. His name was uh, Francis Canning. He has a fascinating and tragic story that I don't have time to get into, but um, a really interesting kind of look at the earliest days of Stoney. Here are two views of this complex. This is taken roughly from what is now Stoney's north fence line. So looking from the south of the complex. And this is a view from the north looking south. 
And I'll point out that this gorgeous white oak here on the right of the picture is still thriving. And this is a modern view of it. And both images give you a sense for the scale of this complex on the landscape and how beautiful it was and is. So fast forward about a decade from when the greenhouse complex and the cottage were built. The Bodine family is now heavily involved in the war, both at home and on the front through the service of their son, William Bodine, who was a highly decorated soldier in World War I. He was wounded in action just before the end of the war. He served in the National Guard. He received the Silver Star, Purple Heart, the Legion of Merit, and the Croix de Guerre, which is a French honor. So what does all this have to do with women in horticulture? I'm showing you here the first evidence that I saw that indicated that Stoneley's history was hiding something special. So in 1920, Elder Bodine placed this ad in a bulletin of the National Women's Farm and Garden Association. She was offering, quote, an opportunity to six women who have adopted gardening as a profession to supplement their theoretical training by the practical training of actual work in greenhouses and gardens under the capable superintendent, Mr. Alexander McLeod. So this means the same year that women finally gained the right to vote in the United States, Eleanor Bodine was recruiting college educated women for Stoneley's horticultural training program. I hope this piques your interest because it sure did mine and I wanted to know more. <laughs> and so here's the results of that. Um, here's the evidence that connects all the dots. This is a 1926 article by horticultural writer and editor Dorothy Ebel in Gardener's Chronicle magazine. She says, quote, in those days of the war, the lawn was turned into a large vegetable tract from which the poor people in the neighborhood received their supply of fresh vegetables and that eight or nine girls were employed as assistants in the garden. And so what does Dorothy, Dorothy's article confirm? It tells us that this is what Stonely was. It was not only the location of significant community war gardens, it was also a trailblazing educational program for women. So the posters I showed earlier relate directly to the work being done by these women in our community as part of the war effort. So you might wonder how did this program work and happily we do know some details about it from the historical record again. We know that in 1916, the Bodine family clearly seeing a need for this kind of training and the escalating war in Europe, they built a dormitory for these women. Let's go back to that key piece of information about the program. The women were quote, housed in a building originally intended for four horses and tool sheds, but suitably refitted for them. One of the girls who possessed a keen sense of humor named the abode Squirrel Inn. So who wants to see Squirrel Inn? Well, happily I can show it to you because it's still there and it's still intact. So it's a charming 1916 house. Here it is laid out on the Olmsted Brothers maps. Here's a drawing from it, uh, from the perspective of what once was Stoneley's chicken run here. Um, and here's a photo looking at it from the front. So from this corner here. And this London plane tree that was planted and mapped by the Olmsted brothers is still there. So the kind of women in this program, they were living in this dormitory. They were training in a one of a kind state of the art greenhouse complex. Where were the community war gardens that these women were attending? We can use the same rich Olmsted Brothers maps of the property to identify their location and what they were growing. We could know that they were growing apples and pears and cherries and gooseberries and currants alongside large vegetable beds. And I used uh, Google Earth to use landscape features to estimate the size of these gardens. Um, so this one here is two and a half acres. This is from the main garden south of what was the greenhouse complex here. Um, there's another one acre of apple orchard next to where Squirrel Inn is right here. And through oral history of the Bodine family, I learned that the family grew vegetables across Spring Mill Road. And it turns out that the Olmsted brothers confirm this. They confirm a one acre vegetable garden across the street. So Stoneley's gardens comprised about five acres plus the greenhouse complex. And these gardens, like Marion Botanical Park, have been hiding in plain sight for over 110 years because knowledge about what once was there has been lost in our community. So these photos are showing what once were large gardens. So at the top, this is a picture taken from the greenhouse complex, looking across a metal fence that marks the northern border of Stoneley. And this other 
uh, photo here is taken from approximately where this red star is and looking at the expanse of where these gardens were. Who were the women tending these gardens? I've only been able to identify one so far. She's a Wellesley College student. Her name is Wilhelmina Josephate. She was training at Stonely in 1918, living in Squirrel Inn and growing food in its gardens. And she was being trained by Scottish immigrant Alexander McLeod. He also has a fascinating story. He was a key figure within the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. He was passionate about horticultural education. Um, here's a photo of him in 1946 with a pipe in his mouth <laughs> at a, a market booth that was offering, quote, free garden information. So you could come up and ask Alex, Alex anything about gardens and he would tell you. So wrapping up our journey along the main line from Marion to Villanova, we come full circle with a final inspiring local connection to the history that Jenny shared. So newspapers revealed in 1921, after the war and the tumult of the post-war years, Eleanor Bodine post hosted a public summer garden tour organized by and support of none other than the Pennsylvania School of Horticulture for women at Ambler. And we assume this tour was hosted by the students in the Stonely program who were living and working there at the time, alongside students from the School of Horticulture for Women, all of whom had newly gained the right to vote. I want to end by thanking the folks who have guided me and assisted with this research. They are too numerous to name. Um, here are a few, including the Lower Marion Historical Society, the Lower Marion Libraries, and the Marion Civic Association, and Jenny, of course. <laughs> Um, and before we answer questions, we have a little bit of time. I want to end with some timeless advice about food on the left and to say that on behalf of the Lower Marion Historical Society, I invite you to join our public visitation hours on Wednesday evenings here at the Lower Marion Academy building where I'm sitting. This is the oldest school building in our county. It was built in 1812 on a large estate that later became home to the Ballakinwood Middle School. We have an outstanding local and regional history collection, and our website is an excellent resource for information about the history of the people and places in our community. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. And with that, I will stop sharing and we can take some questions. Thank you. Absolutely incredible information. This is, oh, I'm so excited. This is <laughs> coincides so well with what we were learning about Laura Barnes, which obviously more about flowers, but um, I just want to uh, start off with a quick question, which is slightly off the garden topic, but on the topic of women in general, because you had touched briefly on Olmsted um, and architecture, and I guess Elizabeth Lee, right, was the name that you mentioned. Um, that whole world of landscape architecture was dominated by men this whole time up until then Olmsted, I guess he would have been gone by then, although his firm was still going on. Were they, was that still like, oh, women can't do this, like leave the gardens to them? Because that was, you know, was Elizabeth Lee the first to venture into that? Am I making sense? Do you want, do you want me to take that, Erin? So um, I featured um, Beatrix Farrand, who was the, in 1880, 1899 the only female member of the founding member of the um asla the american society for landscape architects but the the other there are quite a lot of other ones but what happened is you could go to um so another one i i didn't have time to do all of the ones but there's ellen biddle shipman who's another one that there's books you might have books in the library about her and then there are um, Florence Yoke, who was um, mainly in California, um, and she did a lot of work for the movie industry. There's a lovely new book by my mentor, Val Libby, um, that you should look up, that she published within the last year. And I don't have it here, so I can't remember the title, but that's two landscape architects that were working out west. But look up Valencia Libby, L-I-B-B-Y. She used to work at Temple and now it lives in Blue Hill, Maine. Um, uh, Marion Kruger Coffin. She also wrote a book on her so years ago. How old are you now? How old am I now? Is that what you're asking? Or is she talking to somebody else? Probably talking to somebody else. Um, but uh, so 
Um, oh, and somebody's asking about Laura Barnes. And I know that, um, so Laura is almost the next generation. There's a whole second wave of these women, um, including another one of my men mentors, um, you know, um, oh, uh, Louise Bush Brown, who was one of the early graduates of the school in 1916. So really these first wave of women were very innovative and it's very hard in a short time to explain how out of the box they were. They were coming up with these ideas that no one else had had, even the people that were forming these societies that, you know, it's like now we take for granted, let's form a garden club, let's work together. But the women in the 1800s, you know, I think Quaker women had an advantage because in some of the meetings they had a women's meeting so they could get up and speak, which I swear really gives them a uh, greater advantage. And I, I think a lot of that, um, but there's people on this that I'd love, maybe we can get people to um, come off mute and, and contribute because, and maybe just put your hand up or something if you want to talk. But like, I see Jeff who knows so much about this and there's Joe who brings her perspective. And I saw um, Susan Treadway's on, you know, so there's many people that know aspects of this and, and maybe another time we just do a round table and, um, you know, see what else is out there and people can bring their experience is, to, you know, to it. Because I I know there's a, a there's a lot more and the trouble is in a small presentation, you can give tidbits of it. But to answer your question, um, uh, the, the original question, Autumn, was that there, there are women, but they could go to these schools, but they couldn't, they couldn't get a degree. So like Marion Kruger, Coffin, um, you know, and Beatrix Farron, they could go and study maybe if they had the right, they could pull a few strings and things like that. And they would go and study at the Arnold Arboretum and things to get tree knowledge. But it wasn't easy. Mm. We do have, we have a first question here for both presenters. What and how much support for the War Gardens movement was provided by the U.S. Department of Agriculture? Not much. I I don't think. Did they do any to start off with? There was a there was a big sort of scandal about it because, as I said, they wanted boys to do the work. They wanted prisoners to do their work. They did not want women to do the work. I mean, we make it all hunky dory and everything like that, but these women were up against like the biggest resistance from the status quo. Nobody wanted the women to do this work. And it was really only in this area, the fact that you had the School of Horticulture as a model and Bryn Mawr was involved. And, you know, like the, these women all connected through garden clubs, through the farm and garden, and um, they knew each other and they would basically, you know, write letters to each other and say, you know, what are we going to do about this? And that the, that slide I showed you about the funding in my research of World War One, it seems like it was privately funded. I, I don't know if later on, then Charles Lathrop Pack comes in and takes all the credit and writes a book. And it seemed it seemed like he got a lot of the credit for things that he didn't necessarily do. That's why I was trying not to be mean to all the men on the call. But there we go. It is Women's History Month. And I'll just add, we have a question from Blair Bodine, and I see they're on camera. These are, this is the Bodine family. Hi. <laughs> uh, direct descendants of, of Eleanor and Samuel, who just did amazing things that weren't really, it's hard for us to understand how groundbreaking this was and how special Stoneleaf's history was. And so... I'm so glad that you're here. And so the question they asked is, with the early 20th century women's horticultural clubs, how much were women drawn to these clubs to create their own space separate from male dominated society? And then those others on the call who can answer this, you know, my thought is beyond the garden clubs, there were there was networks of women's clubs doing all kinds of stuff, you know, building libraries and feeding children and building playgrounds and organizing for suffrage and helping with the war effort and it was like when you look at the work that they did and how they did it together and how that was the foundation of so many aspects of our community at that time it's just so interesting to see that history and how it intersects with 
garden clubs and horticulture. And it really was, I think it's a really interesting thing to study because we do have some records from the women's clubs in Ballykinwood and other areas in Lower Marion. And it's a ripe area of research, I think, for someone to to ask some questions about those materials and, and try to answer that question. Jenny, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, from my study of it, it came out of the first clubs. And actually, I think Jeff or Susan might know more about this, but um, my study of it in the Pennsylvania area does seem to lead out from um, the Civil War when there were, um, you know, like in Norristown, there were clubs where they were waiting together to listen for news from Gettysburg. And um, that to me is fascinating because they, you know, like you're getting news from the war, which is not that far away. And so they're waiting there together. And in the meantime, they were rolling bandages and doing things like that. And then there's the whole um, civic association that, you know, downtown, there's a civic association building with its own historic plaque. Um, so the civic association movement, the, the garden clubs were a little bit def different because they had this altruistic aspect of, the, of it and community outreach, but they also had a very strong we want to learn. And when they say correspondence with this country and abroad, they wrote to the Olmsted brothers and said, you know, come and give us a paper or can you, get, you know, send us a paper of how to do landscape architecture and design ourselves and then we'll read it at our meeting and discuss it. So they, they, they weren't afraid of writing to Arnold Arboretum, you know, um, things like that to, to get the best information um and it's it's very interesting because it had this dual thing um that was going on and i know joe has her hand up and she has a question about somebody that she's working on you're on mute so oh somehow you're back on mute on the subject of architecture and women and idella mccurdy uh, is this dynamo figure that, you know, she was my great grandmother's sister's best friend. And the three of them basically built a property in Rhode Island uh, together because my great grandmother and her sister never, she never remarried and her sister never married at all. And Idella was uh, my great grand aunt's best friend from college from Smith. They graduated together in 1912. And I am pretty sure, I don't know if Smith had a landscape architecture program. Do you happen to know? I don't they think they had landscape architecture, but they had botany. Many of the the, the um, schools for women had botany and Penn had botany that women could be involved with. I, I have slides from 1924. Women were in the botany classes there. But Smith obviously has the uh, arboretum there. And I know they use that for teaching. I don't know what courses exactly they, they had, but it was, you know, the, the, the study of botany was okay because, again, it was like you could do herbaria, you could, you know, and then there was the whole language of flowers, you could do that, and it, but you couldn't talk about sex, don't talk about that. You know, so, you know, they say the, the flower was perfected somehow. You know, it's like, okay. <laughs> but it was... So Idella, she was there and came back to Philadelphia soon after that, because she was from here and married an architect, uh, oh. James McCurdy, um, who had an established firm. And so, and then their son together started his, or carried on the firm after that. So when James died in 1960, she designed the whole plot. If anyone has ever walked in the Franconia section of Laurel Hill, it's a corner plot. It's extremely prominent. And we just redesigned it and redid the stonework um, because she had designed the garden. And I wow. have her plans from the records at Laurel Hill with her plant selections. And I got back in touch with her family. So it's like a family affair. Uh, it's oh, that's a, nice. Sort of girl tradition passed down. But I get the impression that she kind of she had those drives and she had those skills and she had those, but she was kind of leaned. She used the resources that James kind of brought to bear. And yeah. I, it blows my mind because for her, I think it was like, oh, great. This is perfect. <laughs> yeah. Because so it, 
but yeah. you bring up a really good point, Joe, because often, like, just take botany. When you look at the botanists that I've studied, I, I mean, I'm partial to a good botanist myself. And the, and uh, Susan Treadway is on the call. I mean, her grandmother, um, you know, the, the, is just uh, like a, she's in my other lectures. Unfortunately, I didn't put her in today, uh, Mary Henry. But and the Henry Foundation, there's a whole nother women's uh, history site that that should be tied into it. But when you look at how um, women, particularly in the Philadelphia area, they they we have some very intrepid, um, you know, um, Mary Henry was an explorer, um, you know, a big time explorer and plant collector. But you, you've got many, uh, she didn't rely on men so much, but you, your point, um, Joe, is that many of the women either um, didn't get the credit for what they designed or found because it, it ended up being published by their husband, by their um, father. So their names don't really come into it. And, and interestingly, many of the botanists who are female studied mosses or ferns or grasses or any of the ones that weren't like top of the anybody else's list to to be studying um and i've got i have um reams of information on on different botanists but you know any of anything that they chose to go into was not easy and i think that we sort of forget that's only a hundred years ago and it, it wasn't it wasn't easy to do any of these things so the fact that they did all the things that they did i still think is amazing and that's why i want to honor them i just want to add idella fell off a horse when she was a child and she was treated as so the reason she was on the board the inglis house is because she had broken her back she used a cane she was legally deaf from the head injury and so her husband kind of treated her like i found out from her grandchildren that she was treated she was treated like glass like she was made of glass, but as soon as he passed away, <laughs> um, the the story goes that she basically, she and my great aunt went around the world twice on the Queen Elizabeth too. <laughs> I have pictures of her and my great aunt Wynne on the backs of camels, you know. Yay! <laughs> the, the kind of hand that gets held back, even though he was um, yeah. supportive of her drives and yeah. his, was given resources and she their property in chestnut hill if i could ever get my hands on the prop like propagating some of the plants that are at elbow lane uh their their former property if anybody knows anybody over there on elbow lane in chestnut hill but so it was just fascinating to learn these things the layers and the story that it tells is pretty it's mind-blowing <laughs> It really is mind blowing. And I think Erin and I, when we had our pre-call, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg. And even if you just stay with Philadelphia, um, there's so many exciting stories to tell. And, um, you know, of, of women that went against the odds and, you know, really managed to do things where they had no business being able to do those things. So, you know, I, I'm just fascinated. I'm, I really feel like this is the beginning of something rather than the, the end of it. Uh, so I hope that we'll reconvene and, and carry on with some other voices in it and uh, get some more st stories. But it does it does take a lot of sleuthing still, even with the Internet, to be able to find these things. And Erin, I have to give you hats off for all of the things you found. I think that that is is wonderful. Really, I, I really enjoyed that a lot. It was a pleasure to research and Jeff gave me some help. I wondered, Jeff, if you have, do you have anything you want to say quickly about any of this? <laughs> Just that you both were great and I learned so many things I didn't know, but what particularly struck me was all the crossovers again. Uh, Aaron, when you were showing some of those committee lists and I'm going, there's Mrs. J. Franklin McFadden and there's, you know, Mrs. Morris Clothier and all these people in this small world. And as I, I, I put in the chat and mentioned, so many were emergency aid of Pennsylvania or, or junior league. The emergency aid would go on to do the Rittenhouse Square Flower Show uh, for so many years. There's a lot of Bryn Mawr College, 
Many were suffragists, a number of them were anti-suffrage actually, but as uh, you were sort of saying, Jenny Rose, it's this great, exciting topic that uh, there's so much more to say about it. And what is fascinating is, is this kind of coming together of people, is these ideas being exchanged and so many great leads and threads being thrown out there that we can all pursue. So th this has been a wonderful evening for me. I, I actually wondered, speaking of the flower market, whether the, who was uh, the gentleman, Alexander McLeod, um, with the green and white, Jeff, was it green and white or red and white they did down at Rittenhouse? I can't remember now. It was remember. the Rittenhouse flower market. Yeah. That's where that okay. photo yeah, was. I thought yeah. it was green and white. Yeah, so that I thought was the Rittenhouse flower market. And yeah. I didn't, I mean, literally, there's so much out there and I've got boxes of it. I was telling, <laughs> um, I, I've sort of got off on, on the horticultural end recently, but I, I really would like to get back to it. But the Rittenhouse flower market, uh, one of the, well, the mover to found it was my husband's great grandmother. And I own, mm -hmm. I'm not wearing it, but her engagement ring I own. Um, and her name was uh mrs george uh no she was um oh my goodness i can't think i've forgotten her name so mrs large mrs uh george gordon mead large so uh -huh. she so she, they, they were related to the meads um and my um so uh her son who i was my was my grandfather-in-law uh used to tell stories of her and i have a lovely picture of her with like a a pit bull terrier it looks like or something dog <laughs> that she she unfortunately passed when she was very young but she had gone to europe and came up with the idea of the flower markets um which you know if you live downtown you couldn't find a flower so and there were parallel ones in baltimore and new york and some of the other cities as well but there's there's a lot and it's also in entangled and each one of the organizations had a slightly different slant so like the farm and garden was more to do with work and the the garden club was more to do with civic engagement and things like that so um and mrs lloyd who jeff put about so i did show her briefly with the uh iris bowl but she she was the one if you go down to the phs mclean library um many of their rare books came from mrs lloyd and her her um her library was the size of a basketball court since we're in March Madness, but you know, it was just incredible. Um, she, and if you had any horticultural questions, the answer was ask Mrs. Lloyd, you know, cause she was the most knowledgeable of the lot. And lots of thanks coming in there in for, from everybody. This has been fantastic. And Joe and Jeff, thank you guys for uh, chiming in with your information. Um, Aaron, Aaron um, and Jenny, even do you guys want to put your emails back in the chat? Because yes. I know with all that you guys do to help preserve this information, um, I know that you love to interact with people on that front. Anything we can learn from anybody else? Mine's very easy, JennyRoseCarry. Uh, oh, my website is JennyRoseCarry.com, but my email is JennyRoseCarry at Gmail. Dot com. So I'll be happy to correspond with anybody. And I would I'd love to uh continue this uh and see what else we can delve up. And I, I I do think we need to get some of this in some sort of whether it's on a website, whether it's you know printed or something, because I know um I know it'll get lost um otherwise. So I'm and if you want to save the chat. The, down the bottom, there's three dots on the right, and you can save it, and it'll go straight to your um, computer. So, um, you know, anyone that wants to save that. Thank you, Joe, for sharing yours as well. Thank you. All right, guys, I have to wrap this up. Thank you all so much, and I'm in agreement. It would be great to continue this conversation. You know, let's see what what else we can learn, um, and and come back and reconvene i'll take you up on that offer both of you guys <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming out this has been absolutely fantastic a great way to to go into the end of uh uh 
Women's History, Women in History Month, and obviously it's spring, so the information going into gardening has been fantastic. Everybody, thank you so much for coming out and uh, and helping support the library and the Lower Marion Historical Society with uh, with all of their hard work as well. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much, Autumn. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Guys. Bye, everyone.